almost two-thirds of world nations suffer from significant levels of corruption. Transparency International says the financial crisis fueled corruption in some nations. Even though more war-torn countries remain at the bottom of the list, is corruption a dis domestic issue or has it become a global disease? And can there be a global mechanism to fight it? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hud Abdel Hamid. Lack of transparency, accountability and good governance are again the main reasons behind the epidemic levels of corruption worldwide. This according to the latest report of Transparency International. This year, however, the global financial crisis and climate change are also mentioned as contributing factors. And that's because many countries seen as more corrupt this year than in 2009 are still reeling from the global crisis. The United States, for example, has dropped out of the top 20 least corrupt countries. It's the first time in the 15-year history of the global league table. It slipped down to the historic low of 7.1 out of 10, sliding three places down from 19 last year to number 22. Greece, in comparison, is down five places to 78. Hungary, the United Kingdom, Italy and France also seen as more corrupt. The common denominators here, recent recessions, huge budget deficits and tough austerity measures. This has all had an impact on perceptions of corruption, which is what the index is based on. But on the flip side, among countries showing the most improvement are Haiti, which has jumped 22 places, Bhutan and Ecuador improving too. Even some recession-hit countries have fared better. Spain and Portugal have both gone up a few places. Well, joining us now to discuss this issue are our guests. In Berlin, Robin Hodes. She's Director of Policy and Research at, at Transparency International. In Skopje, Sam Vaknin. He's a former senior business correspondent for United Press International and was an economic advisor to the Macedonian president. And in London, David Cole. He's managing director of the think tank, the Atlantic Council UK. Welcome to the show. Robin Hodges, let me just start with you. Um, is it a, when you say it's a matter of perception, can you just explain how this survey is done? Yes, of course. I mean, you can't measure corruption because people don't hand over data on how many bribes they pay. So we have a real challenge here. And what we've done over time is we've gathered together the best uh, expert assessments and surveys that are done around the world of experts and business people who have first-hand knowledge of corruption. We've got this from reliable sources, from multiple sources. We pull that together and from that we create our index. Well, um, David Cole, so if this is a matter of perception, not reality, does it have any value in the end? Oh, I think it's got a, a, a very, very high degree of value. Um, Firstly, it's a very well-respected um, report. Yes, there are problems. You, uh, you can't directly measure corruption, but the methodology is very sound. Um, for, for many years, people have, re have agreed that the results it's come up with have been fair and accurate. Um, they also track, for the most part, what people would expect the results to be. You expect the Scandinavian countries to be very clean. Uh, you expect um, other parts of the world to be less so. And so I think, it, I think it's uh, a very solid uh, report or series of reports that's been running for years now. And I think it, it's an extremely useful tool for policymakers. Well, Sam Vaknin, talking about what people expect, one would expect, for example, the United States and the UK uh, to be quite stable, or at least not to go down the list, and they have. So one, what does one understand from that? The... Uh Corruption perception uh, index is indeed about perceptions, and perceptions are about psychology, and psychology correlates very loosely with facts on the ground. So, for instance, psychology is about relativity. If corruption goes down in a certain place, it looks as though it went up in another, even though this may not be the case. Um, psychology is, 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 is susceptible to manipulation. So if a certain government touts its horn and keeps, keeps investing in inordinate amounts of money and time in, in claiming that it is fighting corruption and so on and so forth, it may well succeed in changing perception 
even though corruption itself remains on the same level. Psychology is also about definition. How do we define corruption? Corruption is a strange animal. Uh, practices that used to be defined as corruption er earlier are now legalized in many places. Certain, certain, condu certain conduct which is considered corrupt in one country is considered absolutely legal or even moral or ethical in another. So it's a very slippery, slippery animal, this, this issue of, uh, of uh, corruption. And also there's a question of uh, methodology. So as far as I'm concerned, any index that puts corruption in Macedonia on par, on the same level with corruption in Hungary, the Czech Republic and Latvia is absolutely a useless index, an outlandish index, because corruption in Macedonia is far more pernicious, far exceeds anything that Latvia has to offer, or that Hungary or the Czech Republic, who, which are members of the EU, the European Union, have to offer. So something is wrong, something is skewed with this index, and what is wrong and what is skewed with the index is that it relies on a very narrow base of, of data gathered gathered by people who are who have vested interests on the one hand and it it deals with psychology which is not a very accurate entity so robin hodges in view of what he just said how can you explain then that kind of result well, we think it's very important to look at um, the relative place of countries, but to really look also at the margins of error that we report very um, broadly with our scores. Look, it's very clear that countries that are committed to long-term uh, governance, reform, openness, transparency, and that includes media freedom, by the way. Um, having access to media and access to information correlate very highly with low corruption. Those kind of countries do better, and countries that don't have those uh, mechanisms and don't have the resources to develop those mechanisms, they do worse. This is not about a precision number of, uh, of specific, specific nature. It's about a relative placement um, of 178 countries around the world. And by the way, it's very important that other work we've done, looking at public opinion and so on, show that people around the world recognize what bribery is and they reject it. Bribery is not about cultural uh, or moral issues in terms of one culture or, or value system being different. Universally, bribery has been rejected. Well, talking about bribery, I think one of the main problems of corruption, David Cole, is that the multinationals, the big Western uh, corporations who uh, want to uh, enter a country, want to do business somewhere in the world, actually don't mind, um, you know, bribing people or don't mind just going into the corruption fold, don't they? Um, I'm actually not sure I'd agree with that. Um, certainly there have been some high-profile cases where that has happened. Um, they've done that ultimately, I would say, because there, there is no other option to gain access to that market. However, I don't think their preference is for that kind of system. Uh, clearly, they would rather have a clean, corruption-free system. It's more predictable for them, but also an, a non-corrupt, a reliable uh, political and economic system ultimately is more stable and more profitable in the long run. So I think the question there is how do we put pressure on multinationals that happen to be operating in more corrupt uh, parts of the world to maintain the standards that we uh, expect um, in, the, in the less corrupt parts of the world when they're dealing in less fortunate areas of the world. I mean, I should add as well, the US has moved down it's still a it's still not a corrupt place it's not doing as well as it was but it's still obviously not corrupt but even a small effect there for the largest economy in the world um, has a huge effect around the entirety of the world and so hopefully future improvements in the US will cascade around the world okay well let's look a bit closer at the survey now nearly three out of four countries surveyed ranked five or below indicating significant levels of corruption. Let's review which nations came out on top and which ones didn't. Ten is, of course, the least corrupt and zero the most. It's a three-way tie this year for the top title. At 9.3 out of 10, Denmark tops the list for the fourth year in a row. It's joined by New Zealand and Singapore. Somalia continues to languish at the bottom, also for the fourth year running but it's not had an effective government for nearly two decades.
is closely followed by Myanmar and Afghanistan, tied at 1.4. Iraq not too far off with 1.5. One point worth noting is Russia. At 2.1, it ranks as the most corrupt nation in the G20, or to put it in another way, the most corrupt major economy. Uh, Robin Hodder, so what makes Russia uh, more corrupt? Well, we try not to look too closely at any one system and what's happening there, but to point out that in Russia, as in the countries around it, there are great challenges in terms of um, the rules affecting business, um, the resources in place to have access to public services, of giving people all kinds of chance to have the information that they need to provide the checks and balances on the system there. So in Russia, of course, there's a concern um, that as a major economy and a major investing economy, they really need to come up to international standards. Okay, when well, talking about international uh, standards, David Cole, um, when you look at the list, definitely the West, Western countries are the, at the top of the list, and at the bottom of the list you have uh, the African countries, war-torn countries, etc. But somewhere in the middle you also have, for example, countries like Italy or Greece. Uh, it, it, there is a point in the report that says because they have been hit by the financial crisis, but what's the link between the financial crisis and corruption? Well, it, it's multifarious. Um, the financial crisis puts pressure on, on all budgets. So that's the state budget, the municipal budget, the, you know, an, an individual family's budget. And so there is pressure immediately for two things. Firstly, to make money where you can, even if that's not in a clean way, in an honest way. And also, if that opportunity is presented to you to gain some, uh, some advantage by bribing somebody, uh, to do that as well because of the same pressures. Once that um, mentality starts, it can start to spread because it becomes effectively the modus vivendi. Um, as you, um, as you say, Italy and Greece are doing pretty poorly. Um, I think they're the worst two in the European Union. What's interesting is that Portugal and Spain, which people were grouping in together with Greece and Italy, although they are in, um, e uh, in an economically difficult situation, seem to have actually uh, improved or maintained their position with regards to uh, corruption, which I think is very encouraging there. Um, one of the concerns, though, is that the, that instability also leads to violence and conflict, which fuels further instability and further corruption. You do get a, a, a vicious cycle there. Um, that explains, I think, the. You know, if you look at the bottom of the table, the countries there, Somalia, war-torn for a long time, Myanmar, um, formerly Burma, a military dictatorship, Afghanistan, Iraq, obviously still with very major challenges. Um, and it's a difficult cycle out of which to, to break. I should say, though, if you look at um, the Republic of Macedonia, it's doing rather better than its neighbours. Um, I think, in fact, it's the best of all of the countries in the region, which shows that you can come out of a difficult situation and make improvements over time. So, uh, Sam Vaklin, if Macedonia is doing better than the other countries in the region, what is Macedonia doing differently, or how is it fighting corruption? Macedonia, um, Macedonia simply took advantage, inadvertently, and perhaps even unconsciously, <laughs> of the flaws in the methodology of the construction of the Corruption Perception Index. The Perception Index, index relies on, basically, input from business people and from analysts, essentially. In small countries such as Macedonia, and even a bit bigger countries such as Israel, um, these two groups, the business community and public intellectuals, are in bed with the ruling elites. There is an incestuous relationship between these three, and they are apt to distort facts and to distort reality in order to fit a certain image, a certain message, a certain attempt at branding, and so on and so forth. That's precisely what's happening in Macedonia. The government has self-imputed credentials as a corruption fighter. It spin doctors. It invests enormous amounts of time and money in altering the image of Macedonia as an exceedingly corrupt location. And it has succeeded in altering perceptions. Now, perceptions are very important, but corruption on the ground is far more important. And the all-pervasive pedestrian strain of corruption, which affects the average citizen, 
the citizen that is not polled, that is ignored by Transparency International. That strain of corruption, in my view, is, is far more important than whether a specific businessman pays bribes to a specific minister or not. Because that strain of corruption is the bulk of the glacier that constitutes uh, malpractice and bad governance. And that part is being largely ignored by Transparency International. So the Macedonia targeted the weak spots and the flaws in the construction of the index, cleverly, although admittedly inadvertently. Robin Hodges, you don't seem to agree with what he's saying. Well, I, I don't have such a conspiracy theory about um, the way that um, either research or, or the, the process works in the country. I mean, we're talking about reputable sources of information. Um, you would be questioning really whether these sources um, are doing their job, and I don't think that um, the kinds of organizations that we're talking about can afford to be compromised like that. And I think the information they have is vetted and um, put together and relates in such a way that I think it does build confidence. One also can look at the results of the Corruption Perceptions Index and see that it relates to other um, major socioeconomic indicators, such as levels of human development, levels of economic development. So I think we have something here that really does reflect a little bit more than just perceptions. I also think it's very important to point again to people. You mentioned citizens. We do work as Transparency International on the ground in the countries, in about 90 countries. And one of the other things we do, in addition to the Corruption Perceptions Index, is a global corruption barometer. Here we ask people around the world, is your government effective? Um, how is your government performing? Do you think corruption is a major problem? And have you bribed? And these uh, results correlate highly with the Corruption Perceptions Index. So we're not missing the citizen. We're simply focusing here on public sector corruption. We think it's very important to point out to governments now and again that there's a lot more that they can do and that we're watching. Well, let's look a, li a little more at some of the corruption cases lately. Uh, more than half of the countries at the bottom of the list are in Africa. Recently, two examples have been highlighted. Nigeria's anti-fraud police has listed more than 100 senior politicians and businessmen as unsuitable to run for political office, including a presidential candidate accused of 107 counts of fraud. Nigeria ranked 134th out of 178 nations in Transparency International's 210 list. While Kenya trails well behind at 154, one of the latest scandals there involves mayor, the mayor of Nairobi, who has been charged with conspiring to defraud the capital city council of almost four million dollars. Um, David calls it, it, it just sort of proves a bit that, uh, or the perception actually, that uh, there is more corruption in the third world than there is uh, in the Western world. Now, why is that? Is that, first of all, is that a reality? And is that because simply people there are poorer and are more hungry for money? Um, well, I think the, the, the perception is true. Um, obviously, there are places in the West that don't do as well and um, parts of the third world that do um, better than you would expect. Um, as to why, I think it's a combination of factors. Part of it is poverty. Part of it is opportunity. Pa part of it is the lack of an institutional knowledge and an institutional framework built up over time that can fight graft and corruption. Um, if you look at... Um, say, some of the countries from the West, or say the United Kingdom, where I am, there are institutional mechanisms in place, along with people buying into those rules of the game. And so even if you have the institutional mechanisms in, say, somewhere like Nigeria or Kenya, uh, you don't necessarily have buy-in from all parts of the polity into, uh, into a drive against corruption and then maintaining a low level of corruption. Where that comes from, um, again, partly it's, it, it's poverty and need to do it, part of it the ability to be able to get away with it, and also looking in the, cases of, uh, in the case of Kenya, uh, ethnic violence over the past few years that has caused problems. Uh, if you look at Nigeria, um, ethnic problems as well, um, violence around the Niger Delta, the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta, um, and the effects of uh, oil, particularly in Nigeria, 
it's a little bit of a rentier state. As we know, discovering oil or other minerals uh, isn't actually necessarily very good for having an effective state. Well, Sam Bankin, um, the Interpol says that fighting corruption is among its uh, six top priorities, but there have been many international conferences, there have been many uh, mechanisms put in place. Why hasn't there been any significant advancement in that? Because corruption fulfills two very important functions. It facilitates processes in countries that are broken down, effectively, as, uh, as um, was indicated in countries that lack infrastructure, institutional infrastructure, human capital, and so on and so forth, corruption serves as a facilitator. It's the oil. It oils the machine. And without corruption, frankly, in many of these countries, people would, would, uh, would die. <laughs> they would not have food. They would not have hospitals. They would not have schools. So in many, many countries, corruption is a parallel government. It's a, it's a parallel informal flow of decision making on the one hand and information from the, pu from the public to decision makers on the other. Um, it, therefore, corruption in some respects and in certain uh, locations, certain places, is not necessarily an altogether bad thing. That's point number one. I know that I'm not, I'm not expressing popular opinions, but I'm not here to be popular. I have worked in Africa for many, many years. I served as advisor to the Ministry of Interior in Nigeria. I, I was advisor to the president of Sierra Leone and so on and so forth. So I know the continent very well. And I'm telling you that without a modicum of corruption, the whole thing would have broken down to pieces. That's point number one. Point number two, the West collaborates in the corruption, in corruption. Multinationals are the main drivers of corruption. Banks in Switzerland, in Austria, all over are are the main hoarders of the fruits of, of corruption. Uh, uh, corrupt dictators deposit their money in, in uh, Swiss banks and Swiss banks make, make good use of it, make profits over it, manage the, the private wealth, and so on and so forth. So everyone is implicated, everyone is involved. The, the West has this facade of not having corruption because it vicariously enjoys the fruits of corruption in the third world the same way that it did minerals and, and uh, natural endowments during the colonial period. So, Robin Hodges, in view of what he just said, when, which is a reality that in certain countries, if you want to get about your daily business, you just got to be part of the corruption, uh, is there any point of holding these international conferences or calling for some sort of global mechanism when it's actually each country has to look at it domestically? Well, it does have to be looked at domestically. There's no question that the forms that corruption takes depends on how the economy works. But we do have a global mechanism. We have a UN Convention Same. Against Corruption. So around the world, many countries have signed up to the legal framework that can help stop corruption. But, you know, your other guests mentioned that um, corruption allows education and health. I'd say just the opposite. Corruption costs lives. It costs livelihoods. There's absolutely no evidence that shows that a little corruption helps build a society helps build the economy. In the long run, everyone suffers. I mean, getting medicines that um, are from the black market and aren't uh, going to, to cure you but rather kill you, that's corruption, and that's what we're fighting to work against. We've got to involve people, but um, certainly I think one cannot tolerate corruption as a solution to economic development. Um, maybe a last point there. For example, we've recently gathered the world's leaders together in New York to look at the progress on the Millennium Development Goals. What we see is an absolute impact of good governance. Good governance correlates strongly to better outcomes in terms of maternal health, in terms of clean water, in terms of access to education. So we think there's some really powerful arguments that improving governance, improving transparency works for people. Well, well, we'll see if this good governance will continue in next year's report, but we have reached the end of our show. So I would like to thank our guests in Berlin, Robin Hodges, in Skopje, Sam Vaknin, and in London, David Cole. And thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Please email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Goodbye for now.